Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. And once again, it's really a great privilege for us just to share the little bit by God's grace that God has shown us. And so we're excited to share these things with you. Now, how many of us were here, I believe, last week, Tuesday, when I shared on faithfulness? Okay, so it was Wednesday. Okay. So quite a few were not here. So I'll just recap just briefly, just so that at least we can bring everyone to speed. But um, we spoke about uh, faithfulness and the importance of it. Basically, the way this came about is that, um, so Colorado had asked me to, um, uh, to develop a module for the school of, um, for the global training school. So in Colorado, you've got second year, and then when you go on for third year, you've got the school of ministry, the school of you know, business, worship, and then there's a, a politics, and then there's another one, um, school of media, and then there's another the one called um, the School of uh, sorry, Global Training. Now, these are people that are wanting to you know, either work for the ministry or start an endowment ministries or carries Bible college. And so the, t- um, the title came from you know, the word that God had given to Andrew. So before me and my wife went to Keris, we had been to, I had been to Keris, it was my, f- my fourth Bible school. Now, it's not about how many you've been to, it's because I was very rough on the edges. Amen? So some of us, it takes God longer, you know, to get us to that place. So it, it's not about how many you've been to. But I knew a little bit before we went to Keris to find out what is the word that, that governs Keris Bible College. Because the impact I saw, you know, this ministry having all around the world, I knew that, I mean, this had to be God, okay? Uh, and, and, and also, if God is involved in it, uh, the scripture says, in the beginning was the word. So there must have been a word that God had given Andrew for him to start the charis. And obviously, the scripture God had given Andrew was Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. So if we can have the scripture on the screen, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. So the scripture says, and the things that you have heard from among, among, men, among many witnesses, God was speaking to Andrew through the scripture. It says, commit these to faithful men who will also be able to teach others also. So three things stood out here for me. Number one was commit. I knew that something was to be committed to me and my wife, even though we didn't know the, you know, the intensity of what it was, but we knew that something was to commit. And I want to even encourage you as students. Don't just come and go, come and go anyhow. Don't let it be a routine. This is a scripture that governs a college. There's something in the scripture for you. Okay, but the first thing was that there's committing that is being released into you. God is committing us with something. But here's the thing. The committing is only given to faithful men, not just to men. So faithful men are always committed with something. You don't commit things to men who are not faithful. Very key in life. And also the faithful ones whom things will be committed to will also teach others the same things they've been taught. Not all Andrew said but. Amen? Not all Andrew said but. No, you are faithful in you teaching the very same thing that God had obviously taught you through the ministry that obviously God has called you to. So that's how the whole thing came about. But we said as well that in life, naturally, there's a law of gravity What that shows us is that whatever goes up must come down. Amen? And then we say that, but there's also another law called the force or the law of upthrust. Now, the law of upthrust is a force that pushes you up and prevents you from sinking into the earth. Amen? And so upthrust is actually the answer to gravity. And then we said spiritually, life is like a lift. You are either going down, you are stationed, or you are going up. We, we talked of the fact that carnality is a down button, religion, traditions, ignorance, and lack of knowledge is the station button. And also, but one of the buttons that takes us up in life is spirituality, number one, and also the force of faithfulness. Okay? We define faithfulness and we say that they are, they are, we said faithfulness is the glory of competence and vision. I say that it doesn't matter how competent you are. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have. If you are not faithful, your degrees will die with you. I've seen many competent people who are still crawling on the floor instead of them flying. The scripture says, who are these who fly? Amen. 
And so we, we belong to the top. And the heart of the Father is that you and I will ride in the high places of life. And so your competence, your qualifications, your experience, your expertise, if you are not faithful, if it's not coupled with faithfulness, it means nothing. And I went to extend to say that faithfulness is greater or superior to vision. Amen? And so any vision, it doesn't matter how great the vision is. If that vision ends in the hand of an unfaithful person, that vision will mount to nothing. We said the subject of faithfulness is also not only relevant for ministry, but it's also relevant for industry. Your employer needs you to be faithful. We read from Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, the scripture says, the most man will proclaim each his own goodness. But who can find a faithful man? Amen? Whilst everyone is, you know, parading and telling you about how, you know, the experience, the expertise they have, the scripture says, but who can find a faithful man? The desire in the heart of the psalmist was for faithful people. We went on and we said there are five words that helps us understand the word faithfulness. Number one, devoted, honest, trustworthy, dependable, and loyal. We said if we say that Pastor Shama is faithful, what we are saying is that Pastor Shama is devoted, he's honest, he's trustworthy, he's dependable, and he's also loyal. And first and foremost, we also I made you understand that God Almighty himself, our Father himself, is a faithful Father. Amen? And faithfulness is one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's something you already have. Okay? So this teaching is coming from the place where you can see what you already have, what you already have in you, so that you and I can walk in the reality of what is already in us. Amen? So that we can take our place in the high places of life. And so we, we define faithfulness, number one, to be a keeper. We said, you know, yeah, that faithfulness meant to be a keeper. Through scriptures, you read that Moses was a keeper, David was a keeper, Jesus was a keeper, and our Father himself is a keeper. We went through 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11, and we saw how David, when he went to give bread, you know, when, sorry, when Samuel came, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11. This is when Samuel came to anoint uh, David. And so Samuel goes to David's father's house. His name is Jesse. And he said, and Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? For, for Samuel to ask this question, it means that he wasn't happy with people who were parading in front of him. So he asked the question, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. When Samuel came to anoint David, David was found doing and being faithful with what he was meant to be doing. You know, the scripture says when Jesus comes, he will not tell you when he's coming. But you better be ready. Amen? If your boss comes and finds you, will he find you at work doing what you are paid to be doing? Or will he find you in Cafe Javas? Amen? And I love what Samuel said, because, and Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes. They will not sit until they find a faithful person. No company, no ministry is at rest until they find a faithful person. That's how important this is. And every institution is looking for, awaiting for faithful men and women, people they can trust, people who will be dependable, people who will be loyal to be able to commit things to them. Amen? We saw through as well how Jesus was faithful, and we said that the subject of faithfulness works both in ministry and industry. We brought a few, and then we said number two, faithfulness meant to look after things and not for things. Faithfulness means to look after things and not for things. Don't go to places looking for opportunities and looking for stuff. Okay, go to places seeing how much I can be a blessing. When they tell you to go one, the Bible says go two. Amen? Not now before, because you, you finish work at five, you are waiting at you know, 4.30, you, can't, you are counting down the clock. Amen? If you finish at five, give them extra 30 minutes on, or an hour. Hallelujah? Amen. And then we said to be faithful, number three, meant to be a trader. 
What that means is this, you trade your present for the future. You keep your eye in the future whilst your heart is in the present. I said to you that you preach to the three people in your home cell like you are preaching to 50,000 people. Amen? You preach to the three people in your home cell or the 10 people in your church like you are preaching to 100,000 people. Because I have a, my eye on the future that God has a great plan for me to one day pastor a church of 100,000 people. But right now, if all I have are the five people God has given me in my home cell, guess what? I will prepare with the same intensity. I will prepare with the same passion. I will prepare with the same determination for the five people like I'm preparing for 10,000 people. Amen. We went on and we looked at um, the story of David and we saw how, you know, the Bible says that David was a great shepherd. But his brother gave us an insight and said, man, man, he was actually taking care of a few sheep. And if you study the Bible, you learn that David came from a poor family. And so when they say that a poor family has a few sheep, from where I come from, it's not more than three or five. You will never hear them saying that poor family, they have, they have a lot of sheep. The word lot and poor, they don't, they don't connect. Where I come from, if a poor family has a few sheep, it's about three or five sheep. But it's amazing to me how David was willing to die and sacrifice his life, fighting bears and lions just for five sheep. Amen? As a result of his faithfulness for the few sheep, he was, he was given the Goliath opportunity. And I say that the Goliath opportunities in life are the pathways and the gateways to our enthronement. And guess what? When he got the Goliath opportunity, he didn't do anything different. I said to you, if some of you had to get an opportunity to preach in Colorado in a year's time from now, you start preparing from tonight. And you will study the Greek words also. <laughs> Just to try and use the Greek word. Uh -uh. David didn't do anything different. So what that teaches us is this. What we are doing right now is what is paving the way for us for the future. And what we are doing right now is the same thing that we ought to be doing when the big stage is given to us. They tried to give him Saul's armor. He said, I can't use this thing because I've never tested this thing. It's not now because you have a big opportunity now you want to use the Greek words but you never use it in home cell. Amen? So today I want to pick up and I want to continue from looking at some biblical character, characteristics of a faithful person. So what are some biblical characteristics of a faithful person? Number one, Proverbs chapter 13, verse... Sorry, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13, the Bible says, A tell barrier reveals secret, but he who is a faithful, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. So faithful people can be trusted by those they serve. We are looking at characteristics of a faithful person. Faithful people can be trusted by those they serve. They can also keep confidence. If I share something with you, can I trust that this is confident with you? Faithfulness. A tale bearer reveals secret, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. Amen? So number one, faithful people can be trusted. Number two, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 17. Proverbs 13, verse 17. It says, a wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. Man. In order to bring health, it means you are healthy. An unfaithful messenger brings stress and they, cause, they can cause you to collapse. But a faithful messenger only brings you health. Only health and peace. You don't have to be stressed about them. You don't have to be worried about them. You can trust them to do what they are meant to be doing. Amen? And so number two characteristics of a faithful person. Faithful people are loyal to those they serve. They don't cheat, they don't steal, they don't abuse their position. They don't steal, they don't cheat, they don't abuse their position. Unfaithful people bring sickness to their bosses. The boss is always thinking about you. I wonder what this guy is doing. Ah. They put things in place just to. No. 
You don't have to be one of those. Amen? You don't have to be one of those. Number three, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15. Proverbs chapter 14, verse, sorry, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 5. 14, 5. 14, 5. It says, a faithful witness does not lie, but the false witness will utter lies. Number three, faithful people are truthful and honest. Faithful people are truthful and honest. They don't lie, they don't stretch, they don't bend the truth. They don't stretch or they don't bend the truth. If it's two, it's two, not two and a half, not 1.5. Ah, we had a thousand people that came to the crusade. They don't lie, they don't bend, they don't stretch the truth. Amen? Faithful people do not lie. Number five, and this is a big one. Well, number four, sorry. Number four, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 13. 25, 13. Proverbs 25, 13. Proverbs 25, 13. Like the cold of snow in time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him for his he refreshes the soul of his masters. Faithful people are refreshment to their masters. Faithful people are refreshment. They only bring refreshing to their masters. Amen? Faithful people are refreshment to their masters. And then number five, faithful people know how to answer. This is a big one. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 28 Proverbs 15, verse 28. I just want to give you these scriptures because they are really worthy to go over, go through them, take your time with it. It says, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Man, this is big. The mouth, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer. You need to spend more time studying how to answer something more than the answer you have itself. I've seen many people who had the right intention, but their actions were wrong, and it turned out against them. You can be right. It doesn't mean you have the right to speak anyhow. You see, the challenge or the test is not what somebody has done wrong, but the test is your response in the process. But the heart of the righteous studies how. Man, <laughs> the heart of the righteous studies how to answer. Amen? In Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4, Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4, it says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak. Not just speak. How to speak. You know, I learned from this ministry that because this ministry is a global ministry, what that means is this. It has met, we've got partners from all over the world, from different races, from different places. Now, the way I will speak to a young black lady is completely different to the way I will speak to a colored lady. The way I speak to a colored lady is completely different to the way I will speak to an, old, an elderly white man. Sometimes being yourself can cost you. No, this is who I am, so it's not the same for everybody. The righteous man studies how you've been given the tongue of the learned to know how you need to speak. It's always in the how. Not just speaking. Knowing when to speak, how to speak. Oh, I just, let me. <laughs> the only instruction the Lord gave the disciples when they went out was that he said, be wise as a serpent and be as gentle as a, as a dove. If you study the life of a serpent, a serpent will take five hours to study its prey before it strikes. I remember the Lord saying to me, can you keep quiet for five hours before you speak when you go into a new place? Some people just want to bye, 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 bye. tell you what is wrong everywhere they go. The wisdom of God is that you take your time as a snake to study the environment, to know the people before you start making changes and start doing stuff. Don't just, I remember in Cape Town, someone came and said, ah, you could have painted this building white instead of gray. And then I said to myself, I said, ma'am, God bless you. 
this was what we had in our heart to paint it. But, you know, until God makes you the director, then you can change the color. But for now, you must enjoy it. People always find something wrong. Amen? But the Lord has given you the, man, the tongue of the learned to know how you ought to speak, not just to speak. Let's go to Proverbs, um, well, Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Colossians 4, verse 6. And let your speech always be with grace. Man, always be with grace. Season with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. That you may know how you ought to answer. So it's always in the how. How we answer. Amen. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Ephesians 4, 29, it says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. Let your speech always be with grace. If it's not going to impart grace to the hearer, you shut up. Some of you, you want to give everybody a piece of your mind. After so many years, there's no mind left. Make sure the peace of the mind is the mind of Christ you are given. Amen? Let your speech always be seasoned with grace. Even though they might be wrong, leave them to God. But my response should be seasoned with grace because the test for me is my response to what they've done. Nehemiah said to them, Nehemiah said, Man, are you going to behave un- are you going to behave ungodly because of the oppression of our enemies? Leave them to the Lord. Yes, they might be wrong. Leave them to the law. Amen? But you can also be wrong even though you are right in how you respond. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. How to answer, not just answer. You should spend more time seeking God as to how to answer more than just wanting to give your answer. Some of us have mad diarrhea. We just want to... Oh yeah. Amen? The heart, the heart of the righteous studies to answer. So let's look at a few examples of faithful men in the Bible. Just to learn one or two things. Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 2. Chapter, sorry, chapter 7 verse 1 and 2. Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 1 and 2. It says, Then it was when the wall was built and I had hanged the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem. You see, the charge of a city was given to my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. The charge of the city was given to a faithful man. Every institution is looking for faithful men and women to give charge to. Amen? Amen? Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 7 and 8. Let's look at Abraham. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 7 and 8. It says, You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites. God made a covenant with him. This is not revealed in Exodus. It's revealed in, uh, in Nehemiah. God made a covenant with Abraham because he found his heart to be faithful. Let me say this. Covenant is made with faithful people. Women, don't marry a man who is not faithful. Men, don't marry a woman who is not going to be faithful. Stop looking at money and houses and cars. You can have the house, the money, the houses, and you can be miserable. Covenant is only made on the bed of faithfulness. God made a covenant with Abraham because his heart was faithful. Amen? Because his heart was faithful. Let's look at David. 1 Samuel 22 verse 14. You see, the, the story of men, uh, the secret of men is in their stories. So you see them rising up, doing great exploits for the Lord. And sometimes we want these kind of things, but these are their story or their secrets that, that brought them and got them to that place. And Ahimelech and answered the king and said, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David? Who among all your servants is as faithful as David? who is the king's son-in-law. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. 
Just a few examples of faithful men. You know, these are great men and women in the Bible that we so look up to, but we're looking at their secret as to how they rose to greatness. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him. He was faithful. He was the greatest leader because he was the greatest follower. He followed the Father so well that he made it, he, it made him a, a great leader. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, and also Moses, who was faithful in all his house. And also Moses. And then we looked at three areas where we said, these are the three areas that God is testing you and I on a daily basis. But God does not test us with the curses. You know, sometimes when people are sick, they say, God is testing me. It's for the trial of my faith. God does not test us with curses. He doesn't test you with sickness. He doesn't test you with poverty. He doesn't test you with lack. Amen? He doesn't put disease on you just to test you. No, it's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen? But God tests us, but he tests us with his blessings. God tests us with his blessings. And so three areas, let me say this, you will always be tested before trusted in life. And you will always be trusted before you are entrusted with something. You will always be proved before approved. I'll show you now shortly. But let's go to... Um, First Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 to 10. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 to 10. It says, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine. It didn't say wine. It says much wine. <laughs> Amen? Not greedy for money. Holding the mystery of the faith. You see, faith is a mystery. It's the mysteries of faith that puts you above the miseries of this life. With pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. You can't put anybody in leadership. That's why you've got chaos everywhere you go. Even in the body. Even in the churches. You've got so much chaos because people are just put into positions without not being tested. So let these first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons. They will come and tell you. Man, each man will proclaim each his goodness. Oh, I've pastored for 20 years. Jesus was in ministry for three and a half years. His impact has been greater than anybody else. It's not how long you are in ministry. It's the impact you have with the time that God gives you. That's ministry. Amen? Let these first be tested. You will always be tested before you are trusted. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Just look at Paul's heart in this scripture. He says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may also be encouraged when I know your state. Verse 20. He says, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. So Paul is revealing how much he cared for the Philippian church. But in order for him, for him he, he wants to send someone that he knows will care for them the same way. Timothy was tested. If you go to verse 21, he says, For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. Number verse 22, he says, But you know his proven character. You know his tested character. Oh, you know, we often get phone calls in Cape Town. That, you know, some pastors will call you, oh, I've been, I've been to a Bible school for three, uh, two years. Can I just come to Keris and, uh, and do the third year? I said, sir, what is flesh is flesh. What is spirit is spirit. Thank God you learned your two years, but at Keris you start from first year. You see, people just want to go to the top without first not. You know his proven character. You know his tested character that as a son with his father he served with me in the gospel he was serving he was being tested he was being proven amen he was being proven and so he wanted to say let's go to colossians chapter 4 verse 11 let me give you a few more scriptures colossians chapter 4 verse 11 he says and jesus who is called justice there are 
These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved, they have tested to be a comfort to me. They have proved to be comfort to me. They have tested to be comfort to me. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. He said, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful, and faithful, not just son, and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in the church. Commit this to faithful men who will also teach others also. He was not teaching something else from what he has heard his father Paul teach when he came to the gospel. Oh, Andrew said, but. Andrew said, but. Faithful. Faithful people. Faithful people. You want to choose people that you know will represent you well with somebody else's name. Faithful people. So people have to be tested. People have to be proven. Amen? And so we looked at the three areas of faithfulness and where God tests us. We went to Luke chapter 16 verse, from verse 10 to 12. From verse 1 is a story of the unjust steward. And so from verse 10 to 12, Jesus summarizes the actions or the behavior of this unjust steward. And Jesus is saying, he said, for he who is faithful in what is least is also faithful in what is much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. This is a statement of fact. What Jesus is saying is this. If you are not faithful with the least, you will never be faithful with the much. And so the way we see or we know if you be faithful with the much is your faithfulness with the least. And so right now, what is the least God is giving you for the much he has in store for you? Because your faithfulness now is what determines your faithfulness with the much. Maybe you are called to be a pastor to pastor 100,000 church. But right now, God has given you 10 people in your church. How faithful are you with those 10 people? Because that is what will determine your faithfulness with 100,000. Oh, one day when I become, it's a lie. If you can't give tithe when you're earning $50, you'll never give tithe when you earn $50,000. And so the first area where God tests us it's in the area of the least. Your faithfulness in the least. You are unemployed, and so God gives you work. Amen? You get work, you begin to get a salary, and all of a sudden, God is no longer your source. Now you are busy when you have to come to church. Your faithfulness with a little. And then when you pass the test of the little, verse 11 he says, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous member, who will commit to your true trust? So who will commit to your trust the true riches? Once you pass the test of the little, God will give you money. Is it through your business or through your work? God gives you money. Here's the thing. True riches are not money. True riches are people. Amen? If you are not delivered from mammon, from money, you will milk people for their money. And so before God puts you over people, he wants to make sure that you are delivered from money. So he will give you money to see how you treat money. Will the money have you or will you have the money? Will it still be your source because now you are getting a salary? Will you still respect people when you never had money? Will you abuse the money or use the money? And so as we win in these areas, that's how we get you promoted. And then once you win in the area of finances, verse 12, the next verse, verse 12 said, if, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give what is your own? What God is saying is this, God has your own for you, your own ministry, whether it's in business, whether it's in church, ministry, whatever it is, God has your own for you. But before your own, he will first give you what belongs to somebody else. And how faithful you are with somebody else is what will open the door for you to get your own. I said to the guys in Cape Town, some of you don't have your own houses because you don't know how to take care of the flat you are renting. He has your own for you. But he will first give you what belongs to another man. If you are faithful with what belongs to another man, 
Men, you'll be faithful with your own. Amen? What is it that you have that belongs to another man? I will encourage you to please, men, give it your best. Protect it with your heart. Take care of it like it's your own. Amen? And so we also went on and we looked at the example of David. And we said here, if we go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, you and I know David to be a great shepherd. Amen? But here, his brother, his brother gives us an insight to how many sheep he was actually shepherding. He says, now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to, him, to man. And Eliab's anger was arose against David, and he said, why did you come down here? And with whom did you left those few sheep in the wilderness? David was a great shepherd, but how many sheep was he shepherding? Few. You see, you and I will always start very small in life. You and I will always have few in life before, because the path of the just will always shine brighter and brighter. Amen? And so our days ahead is better than the day before. My experience today will be less than my experience in time to come. Amen. So we will always start small. So maybe you've been called to be a pastor and you have about 10 members in your church. For some of you, it will just be your family. But you minister to them like you are ministering to 10,000 people. Amen. And that was what opened the door for David. Man, number two, how do we handle the small things that are committed to us? How do we handle the small things that are committed to us? Or let me say, the little things that are committed to us. Number one, we need to recognize and appreciate our small beginnings. How do we handle the little things committed to us? Please don't curse the little you have. Bless it. Amen? When Jesus had to feed, the, I mean, you know, the multitudes, even though the fish and the bread was little, he didn't curse it. He lifted his up, Father, thank you. In all things, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Some of you are, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough for the month. You're already cursing the little you have. Amen? In my house, we don't say we don't have. We say we've got plenty. When I say we've got plenty, my wife knows what we are talking about. You will never hear me say, I don't have. Because the Bible says you have all things that pertain to life and godliness. You never say you don't have. When I say I've got plenty, my wife knows what I'm And when she says I've got, we've got plenty, I know what she's talking about. You are busy cursing the little that you have. Jesus lifted it up. Father, thank you. Father, thank you. Bless the little that you have. Recognize and appreciate your small beginnings. Like I said, every one of us will always start small, except if you are the queen of England. Amen? So whether you start small in marriage, I mean, who was it? I think it was Bishop, Bishop Herbert's wife who said, man, when I married him, he came with two plates. He came with one trouser, one shoe. We will all start small in life. Amen? Because the end of a thing is always better than the beginning. But you have to see a future in the person's future. Amen? Number two, how do we handle the little things committed to us? We must be enthusiastic about our responsibilities assigned to us. We must be enthusiastic about our responsibilities assigned to us. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 17 to 20. 1 Samuel, you remember when his, David's older brother asked him, with whom did you leave the sheep with? This was, you know, uh, David's answer. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 17 to 20. Then Jesse said to his son, David, take now for your brothers an, an ephah and, this, and of the dry grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp, verse 18, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of the thousands and see how your brothers, um, and see your brothers fare and bring back you know, news of them. Verse 19, he says, and now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Verse 20, it says, so David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper. We said faithfulness means to be in the keeper. 
He did not only leave the sheep. He left the sheep with another keeper, another faithful person that David knew he would do the very same thing for the sheep. You see, this is why Jesus could not leave us without the Holy Spirit. First, please hear my heart. Jesus left us with the Holy Spirit because we would do the same thing that he did and even greater. He would not have left us to somebody who was going to make us do less than he did. And this is one of the reasons that you would know. I said to my, I said to my wife, we would know when the time is right for us to leave this ministry if we are asked to move on. When we've raised somebody that we know would do the same thing that we do and even greater. Until then, it's not time to move. Jesus couldn't have left without making sure the Holy Spirit was with us. He, wouldn't, he, he would have been unfaithful. You see, faithful people will always commit the things committed to them with like-minded people. With people who will do the same thing. Who will be willing to lay their life down for the sheep the same way David did and even greater. But here's a point. He left. He rose up early in the morning. He was enthusiastic. He couldn't wait to get up. He couldn't wait to get up. When you, when you rise early, you can't wait to do something. You are so enthusiastic that, man, you can't even sleep at night. You can't wait to wake up again. What time do you show up at school if this is the least God has given you? Do I come, you know, one minute to ten? What time do you report for duty when you start at 8.30? Do you come 29 minutes past eight? David was so enthusiastic. Faithful people are always enthusiastic, always excited about the assignment. If you lose your joy, please be honest and tell your bosses, maybe your time has come to an end. Because it will be painful. If you're not enthusiastic, you'll never be faithful because you go through the motion of the day. He was enthusiastic. Amen? Number three, how do we handle the little things committed to us? Whilst moving to the bigger things in life, keep your eyes on the small things. Whilst you are moving on to the bigger things in life, keep your eyes on the small things. What do I mean? Many times when people are promised with big things, they lose respect for the little things in life. When they are promoted, all of a sudden, they don't respect people they used to respect them anymore. They don't value people the same way they value them before the promotion. They abandon the first rule of faithfulness. Don't despise the little things in life. Don't look down on people and disrespect people. That's why I said to people, I said, man, this, the way you treat Jonathan, who is our custodian here, is the same way you treat Pastor Janaid, who is the director. You see, they've got different titles. We are different parts of the body. Jonathan might be the nose. Janaid might be the eye. They've got different responsibilities. Janaid is not better than Jonathan. You treat Jonathan with respect. Good morning, sir. How are you doing today? Amen. He comes and he hugs you. Hallelujah. When you see Janaid, good morning, sir. Don't undermine people. They are both children of God first before their title. They are both children of God first before their title. Amen? So don't treat Jonathan because he's a custodian of the place. And then when you see Janet, oh, good morning, sir. God bless you. No. The same enthusiastic you have for Janet, you should have it for Jonathan. When you see Jonathan, hey, good morning, sir. How are you doing today? Amen? Don't abandon the first rule of faithfulness on your way to the top. Hallelujah. Oh, man, God is so good. Guys, it pays to be faithful, man. Don't do it because everybody is doing it. Don't cheat your way because everybody is cheating their way. Don't lie because everybody is lying. Choose to stand out and God will honor you and God will promote you in no time. Amen? Faithfulness with other people's property. Let me even say, including their wives. You see, Joseph did not run from Potiphar because his wife was ugly. He ran away because he was conscious of the Lord. 
Amen? He ran because he was conscious of the law. So the question is, as we round up, how do I best steward other people's properties? How do I best... Remember we said the first one, how do we handle the little things that is committed to us? And now the second, how do I best handle other people's property? Number one, regard other people's properties as your own. Amen? Regard other people's property as your own. If, your friend, if you are using your friend's car, or if you are driving a rented car, don't just drive it anyhow because it's not yours. Amen? You must take care of, man, that thing is costing somebody something. It's costing somebody something. I remember, well, in Cape Town, um, not long ago, you know, we've mixed the place, so we're looking for a bigger venue and a bigger space. I, I had a meeting with the landlords, and I told them we needed a, uh, a bigger space. And I said to a man, folks, I mean, when they, give me, when they gave me the price, I said, no, this is too expensive. We've been here for the past, I mean, five or six years almost. I said, here's the thing. You are getting your building back from us better than you gave it to us. Then they kept quiet. Always purpose to leave a place better than you found it. Always purpose to give more than what you can take. Don't, don't be the people that will always want to take, 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 take. They'll find opportunities just to take. No. If they ask you to go one, go two. Let your time count in the season and the time God has afforded you. That when I leave, when I hang my towel, man, I can look back and say, I contributed in a positive way towards this thing. Always leave a place better. Purpose to leave a place better than you found it. You see, it's an attitude of the heart. It's the Lord that does it. But we have to have that heart in us. To say, Lord, how can I use my life to contribute you know, to the better of this thing? Amen? Number two, be a trusted burden barrier for those who depend on you for support. Be a trusted burden barrier to those who depend on you for support. I said to the directors that I'm privileged to be overseeing, I said to them, for my upline, my direct boss is Tanera, Mike and Kerry, Billy Eppard. I said, for them, I'm here to give them rest and peace. But for my downline, I'm here to frustrate you. For my upline, I'm here to give them rest. I'm here to give them peace. But for my downline, I'm here to frustrate you. My frustration to you is that I don't want you to remain the same. I want you to get better. I want you to do more than I have done. I will intentionally put you in situations that will take you out of your comfort zone because I want to stretch you. I don't want to leave you the same. You can bark, you can hate me, but my heart is for you to be better and to be better than I've ever been. Amen? We have to stretch each other. Amen? So we are here to be burden barriers to those who depend on us. And number three... To be faithful, you must know your limits and do not abuse your opportunities given to you. Don't abuse opportunities. Don't abuse opportunities given to you. And just lastly, just a few boosters of faith with the three minutes that we have. A few boosters of faith. Things that can help me be faithful, and do things the way God intends for me. Number one, walk in the fear of the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 2, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hananiah and Hanani, Hanani and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. The fear of the Lord, number one. Number two, be individualistic. Don't don't compare yourself with other people. And don't be carried away by what others are doing. Amen? Be individualistic. Don't compare yourself to other people. Amen? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. It says, aspire to live a quiet life and mind your own business. Oh, no, it's the wrong scripture. 1 Thessalonians. Is it chapter 3, verse 11? Chapter 4, verse 11. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. It says, aspire to live a quiet life. There you go. That you also aspire to lead a quiet life and to mind your own business. Stop interfering with other people's business. Mind your own business. Amen? Be individualistic. Don't compare yourself to other people. And number three, focus on your assignment per time. What that means is this. 
Janet might be in the 10th chapter of his assignment with the Lord. Amen. Julia might be in the 5th chapter. Julia should not compare his, herself to Janet. Her 10th chapter is on the way. Stop comparing yourself with other people. Comparison is a game of fools. And everyone who participates in the game of fools, you end up frustrated more than you engage in it. Number four, we need to serve heartily. Colossians chapter 3 verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men. The stuff you guys know, this do all things. We do this day with the spirit of excellence unto the Lord. Do all things unto the Lord. Do it heartily. Amen. Do it heartily. There are many active people who are not hearty. They are very active, but their activity, their activeness is just to please and to impress. But their heart is not in it. Their lips are drawn to me, but their hearts are far from me. They are very active. Always wanting to serve, but their motive is wrong. Amen? Many are active so that they can be commended. Do it heartily, not faithfully or actedly. Don't pretend with it. Don't pretend with it. Amen? Number six, number five, serve joyously and cheerfully. Joseph served with joy. Amen? We serve joyfully. 